I'm an industrial psychologist uh, that specializes in cognitive neuroscience, but if you ask me what I do on the weekend at a bri, I'll tell you I'm in HR. <laughs> I, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Bridget. And I want to pick up a few things that uh, some of the earlier presenters talked about. And I really liked what, what the prof said about a blend between hard and soft. And there's a lot of that in the room here today, uh, not people, I mean expertise. And uh, we'll see there's a definitely a blend between a lot of technical compliance and safety knowledge and also the behavior stuff, the sort of soft stuff. And what I'll be talking about today is making the soft science hard. And that's essentially what we do with uh, cognitive neuroscience. Um, <clears throat> What I also like is how we talked about different elements of understanding human behavior, but we still, and still emerging, we're still not talking about the brain. And it's funny, because when we talk about food science, we don't stop at the observable mold on the food. We go down to the molecular level. But when we talk about behavior, why don't we go down to the molecular level or equivalent neuroscience? And the reason that exists is because there's still a lot about the brain we don't know but there's an incredible amount about the brain that we do know that matters, that re results in behavior change. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And as promised to uh, Linda and Bridget, I'm gonna leave you with practical examples of how to do it in the next 20 minutes. So a little bit about, about us and what we do. So even though in South Africa, neuroscience, and maybe in this room might be a new word, We've been doing it for the last 20 years. A lot of the clients, such as Walmart in, in the North America, are some of our clients. Uh, I represent the Neuro Leadership Institute, which is a global research-driven leadership institute. Uh, we operate in 24 countries, and we're a cognitive science consultancy. Essentially, we take some of the world's best PhD neuroscientists, organizational leaders, and solve the problems that they talk about the most. One of those being how we change behavior. Our vision is to really transform leadership through neuroscience by giving us a new language. Of the three practice areas that, that leaders talk about the most, it's not unsurprising that we talk a lot about leadership and culture and providing clear direction. We also specialize in performance engagements and challenging conventional wisdom, because what we've found with neuroscience is on one hand we're validating what we've known in psychology, but we're also challenging and providing empirical evidence that is, that is challenging conventional wisdom. For example, we know that eight hours in a day doesn't change behavior. No surprise there, right? But now we know what does. And those, and those are some of the things that I'll be sharing with you today. And I always like to begin with this quote. <clears throat> it's been estimated that we are exposed to more information in one day than people in the late 1800s were exposed to in a seven or eight year period. The world has definitely changed. The demands on our brains have increased, but has our understanding of the brain changed? Well, the good news is that it has, and that's what I'll be trying to share with you in the next 20 minutes. What I'll be sharing with you is, is something that we do at the New Leadership Institute, is we do research briefings. We partner with organizations by first helping you understand the research, giving you a summary of 20 years of white lab coat research, and giving you three practical things to do in your 9 o'clock meeting. We obviously don't have a lot of time here together today, and there's a lot of information to talk about, but I'm going to keep it short, practical, and impactful. I'm going to talk about a few governing principles of the brain about the social brain, which talks a lot to culture, and I'll be giving you a model called the SCARF model, which is developed by our CEO, Dr. David Rock. And I'll be talking about how we can actually build a culture of trust that the prof was alluding to in the beginning of the presentation. Now, the first thing to remember about the brain is that we have one central organizing principle. Above all motivation theories, above all personality traits, above everything, irrespective of culture, race, age, and gender. Everything we do in life is based on the principle of minimizing danger and maximizing reward. We all have it. It's the reason why all of us here are alive today. And it governs our behaviors, it influences how we see the world, and it influences how we behave, how we respect, and how we make uh, sense of safety. 
But here's the thing. In our dichotomy of our brain, where we can define a threat and a toward state, a danger and a reward, a danger is much more motivating than a reward. For example, if a snake crawled into this room right here, I'm not going to wait to see if it's a friendly snake. I'm going to assume it's a bad snake. That threat mentality is the reason why we're alive today. It's the same reason when some of these other uh, psychologists in the room debrief you on a personality profile, you might have 16 attributes that are pretty good, but you're only really going to remember the two bad ones. That's because in the brain, there's four times more real estate dedicated to a threat response, to interpretate, interpreting danger. It's actually estimated that we scan our environments for threats five times a second. We're hyper attuned to threat, but yet our world has changed with much more distractions and much more threat. Now for the next piece, I wanna ask, I wanna ask uh, everyone a question. Can everyone think about a time when they had a big fright? And if you can't think about one, let me come to your table and I'll shake you. <laughs> maybe you, you're in a car accident, maybe you had a near-death experience, that sort of thing. Can everyone remember an experience at, at a time like that? Everyone can? What happened to you in that moment? Or who, let, me, let, me first, uh, let me first rephrase that. Who, was, who will be uh, comfortable sharing that experience just quickly for a second? Maybe they're in a car accident. Does someone want me to come and shake you at the table? I can do that. Great, thanks. I'll be the roving mark for now. The cameraman hates me, huh? Yeah. Great. Would, would you mind sharing the experience and then also sharing what happened in your body physiologically? No, I can't remember that much. But anyway, I was in a slight car accident. We swerved off the road and into a fence. But at that point, all I can remember was that I couldn't um, control the motor vehicle, so I just basically left everything, shut down, and closed my eyes and waited for impact. Was that, a, was that an effective uh, re response in the moment? No, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to unpack there and understand a bit better, and I want to also, who's ever in charge of the lights, I also want to make sure you keep the lights on for the rest of the presentation. What's very important often we don't take into consideration in presentations is that it's not really about the content. It's about what's happening in your head. I don't really care about what's happening on the screen. I hear about you understanding it and me asking about it a week later and you remembering it. So the action's not up there. It's here. For those of you that are not wearing makeup, this kiss. <laughs> what I was trying to unpack there is that there's a connection between the body and the mind. And that's what neuroscience is in very simple terms. It's a physiological response. Based on what's happening, you can drive a, a, a nervous system reaction of neurochemicals and systemic responses going into a fight or flight mode. When you're in a fight or flight mode, you might go into uh, what they call fight, flight, flock, or freeze. It's one of two states. You go into a threat state or a toward state. A threat state, you fall into habitual learnt behavior, fight or flight. Your blood starts pumping to extremities in your body. You don't use conscious and rational thought. You often uh, um, fall back on learnt behaviors that are efficient and quick. Because to think reflexively in that moment requires cognitive capacity. You can't think and estimate the right decisions of what to do, where to go, who's in the car, have I got life insurance, have I got, uh, have I got a prenup. Those things aren't, aren't going to help you in that moment. Habitual fight or flight behavior is going to help you, and your brain knows that. So what we've found with neuroscience and in those moments is that you have a lowered field of view, you have lower access to cognitive working memory, you have less ability to be creative, and you're less likely to collaborate with others because you don't need to have those in a fight or flight situation. You need to have quick, effective decision, uh, decision making and efficient behavior processes. In simple terms, your brain's not prioritizing its best thinking. It's prioritizing its survival thinking, a fight or flight response. So the brain's the brain's based on organizing our environments into a threat or reward state. It's hypersensitive to threat and very easily to be threatened and it puts you in one of two states, either your best thinking or your worst thinking. 
And here's the kicker. Our brain does not distinguish between social and physical threat. When, for example, you were close in that car accident, and thank you very much for sharing. When you were close in that car accident, in that fight or flight or freeze response, the same neural pathways that light up in that moment are the same neural pathways that light up when you make a bad safety choice and are called out on it. It's interpreted the same way in the brain. So what does that mean for a fight or flight response? Have you ever called out someone on a safety mistake and they dug in their heels, got very defensive? Probably weren't able to think reflexively to see all the decision makings for what it is because they're too busy covering their own ass. Excuse my language. Has anyone seen that before? Well, what we've discovered with breakthroughs in neuroscience is that it activates the limbic system. It's an older part of the brain, right here. And that's an older part of the brain that is involved in instinctual and habitual behavior, fight or flight responses. Not your best thinking, but also your most efficient thinking. And what we've found is that that kind of behavior and that kind of understanding of behavior has changed the gap between how we change behavior in the workplace. Because, I mean, if we had got behavior change right, we, wouldn't, we all wouldn't be here today. There also wouldn't be a $50 billion self-help book industry. I mean, we, we're literally planning how we can have a settlement on the moon, but we still can't figure out how to lose weight. My missus is a dietitian, by the way. So. She's very supportive of me. So what I want to talk about now I'm just see how we're doing for time. Perfect. Great. So what I want to talk about now, I'm just going to recap some of the points and I'm going to put it back to you. We rely on this response because the brain has a limited neurological capacity or capacity for activity. The brain is, the brain is estimated to only have two hours of conscious thought in a day. For the rest of the day, you believe to be unconscious. And if you, if you don't believe me... <laughs> Some people, you may think, are never conscious, but <laughs> maybe it talks to leadership culture. <laughs> when you are first driving a car, all right? When you're first driving a car, you might start in the car, do a 16-point turn, change the gear, always second gear every time you go around the corner, check the lights, check the blind spot, all those sort of things. Sounds familiar? How many times did you change gear driving here today? Can't remember, right? It's a bit dangerous. I wonder when unconscious people driving cars, <laughs> let alone food safety, what about traffic safety? What happens there is that learned behavior has been hardwired into the older habitual part of the brain. Because we have a limited capacity to actually learn and change behavior, it gets hardwired. So it becomes unconscious and efficient and we can do it without thinking. That's why you literally can drive and talk on the phone. Because you don't have to consciously think about shifting gears. That's habitual and unconscious. And the reason that they're unconscious is because they allow us to do tasks without interruption. Talking to the prof's uh, example with, with, with Sam in the production line, they need, to, they need to focus on their task. That behavior becomes habitual. It's easy, it becomes hardwired into the brain because the brain loves certainty, it loves autonomy that I'll be showing in the next couple of slides as well. And here's the thing with regards to safety. In times of acute risk, that automated response can provide faster responses without cognitive delay. So in times of risk, in times of being called out, we, get, we dig in our heels and we go to more habitual behavior. Actually, what we call in neuroscience, unconscious biases or mental shortcuts. We go to things that feel right. We go to the answers that seem obvious, especially in a threatened state. But it's not always a bad thing because it keeps us safe. In a fight or flight response, it's great. If, for example, I've been using a supplier for the last 20 years and I get a new contract, I'm probably going to go to them again because based on my experience and my hardwiring, it makes sense. However, in the emotional environments that we live in, the irrational impulsive behavior can have negative safety and personal outcomes. And that's the soft element that we're talking about today. What I'll be sharing with you in the next minute uh, is a conceptual or is a model that helps us frame that soft behavior and how to make it practical to play to these social triggers. But first of all, I'd like to hand it over back to you just for two minutes to talk amongst your table to digest what you've just heard. And I will pass the mic around to answer any questions and share any insights. We'll just go for two minutes just to uh, further digest anything we've heard today. 
Okay, great. We have uh, two lovely mic runners on either side as well. Please raise your hand if you'd like to share any insights or perhaps uh, thought-provoking questions uh, from any discussions at, at, the, at your tables. Come on, guys. Come share. Hi, I can't speak very well at the moment. <laughs> no, that's not going to help. Um, just one thing that we've always considered in our company, we have a very agricultural background and people come from very poor backgrounds. The houses that they live in are not safe. They're certainly not hygienic for the most part. Um, and I think that's something from a South African perspective that might be different to a lot of other countries. I wonder how you think that's going to, what we can do to actually assist in that, um, this whole neuro change in the brain that we have to get around. I love that question. Thank you very much. So a part of that is, is part of what, I, what, what I've done in my, in my thesis research as well, because I'm very critical of a lot of research we get from overseas, and I believe that we also need to have African solutions for African problems. What I do like about this is that everyone has a brain. There's also very baseline understanding behavior that's relevant to everyone. There are definitely cultural factors. There are definitely things that are differentiate us, but what the things that do in include us is our brain. And what I'll be talking about in the next model, the actual SCARF model, it's a model for creating inclusion. So it talks to biological, physiological, and instinctual drivers of needs that we all have, irrisp irrespective of systemic or institutional uh, in inequity. Hi, um, thank you for an interesting presentation so far. Um, I have a question, I mean, we did discuss um, other things around the table, but I actually do have a question about um, how does, um, and um, we, have it, we had also discussed it, I'm from the Western Cape, so the Kosa culture there is quite big, um, and some Kosa men actually see it as a threat if a white woman um, is their boss. So you, how do you, and I don't know if that's even a brain thing, but how do you get that gap breached, um, that it's not um, you know, seen as a threat, that um, a cultural difference, but also a racial difference in terms of respect and threats and all of that? Great question. I think, you, have you seen the rest of my presentation already? Because I'm, I'm actually about to discuss it. With the, with the SCARF model, it talks to the very first principle of status. When you undermine status, you put people into a threat state. When they dig deep, uh, have emotional, irrational thinking, not their best thinking, but there are other triggers that you put them into a towards state. Because the best thing about knowing what triggers that threat state of social interaction is you, if you can play to that trigger or mitigate it, you put them into a towards state where they do have their best thinking. I can also relate to that. I started my, uh, started my career in the South African construction sector, and we, we, and we had a lot of pr uh, problem with putting very qualified engineers onto sites that were different in gender. Um, very difficult to, to, to manage that, uh, that, that challenge. I think I'll take one last question to keep it going along. Yeah, thank you. I'm Inge Gavis from McCormick. Um, culture, what is culture? Eventually we all live culture and we were just discussing here um, it would be good for employees to change their culture, but doesn't it start at home? Where is at home? Uh, let's just think about littering in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a culture change? We expect something in a factory to be clean, to be sterile and whatever. But as soon as we go out of the factory, we live something completely different. Mm. We eat our sweets or we have our chips and we throw away the plastic that goes into the water that litters everything. Eventually, we reconsume it through micro plastic. Hmm. Some, some great questions and the right kind of questions we need to be asking as well. What is culture and what is behavior outside of the organization? What I'll talk about in the next part is the R of the SCARF model, which talks to relatedness and how we have a sense of in-group and belonging. And I also talk to why people actually are more prone to litter as a result of them not feeling included or excluded. But that's the kind of level we need to be start talking about when we talk about habits. Habits are not just individual compliance, but they talk to a wider mindset and values that are underpinned by, the, by a shared culture.
So what I've been threatening you with for the last 10 minutes, the SCARF model. The SCARF model is a model of social triggers that we understand put you either into a threat state or a toward state. A state where your brain has its best thinking, where it can think reflexively, take ownership and accountability and change behavior, or a threat state where it goes into its most habitual and uh, readily available behavior, its fight or flight. Basically, it's worst thinking versus best thinking. It's summarized through years of research into the SCARF model into an acronym that's easy to understand. Because the first thing I'm sure that you'll know with regards to culture is, okay, great, we have seven cultural values of the business. First question is, how many can you name right now? Second of it is, how much of it is unconscious? Third of it is, how much are you actually living? The brain's a limited capacity to take in information. We need to be cognizant of that when we change behavior. The first part is status. It relates to how we fit in the hierarchy. Are we less than or better than people? And that's what often happens when we give negative feedback or call people out with regards to safety culture or making a mistake. It's undermining status. So that's when people already uh, go, into a, go into a defensive state, a, fight, a flight or fight mode. Further, by the very definition of you being a manager, that's challenging someone's status. By the very definition of you being a QA person, you're challenging someone's status. Because remember, the brain's hypersensitive for threat, four times more real estate for threat than toward. So just being defined by someone else judging your job, you're already threatening someone. So they're already in a state where they're not having their best thinking. The second part relates to certainty and its ability to predict outcomes. The brain likes certainty. The brain requires certainty. It makes things easier to change. Often when things go wrong, when things become uncertain, we go into a fight or flight mode and we narrow down on the error. We don't take in all the other bits of information that's relevant because we're going into a fight or flight mode. We're trying to create certainty by looking at what's very certain. We don't prioritize our best thinking and we don't probably make a, the best decision. Autonomy talks to our sense of control. We require certainty, but also a sense of, are we governing our own journey? How can we give that to our employees? This point talks to culture. It talks to the hypersensitive social brain and then meaning, the meaning to define an in-group and an out-group. It's so hypersensitive because it comes from a biological condition when, when we define the in-group, we're part of the herd. We have access to social structures, sexual partners, the best food, and ways to survive. When you're part of the out-group, it meant life or death. That now gladly has changed. We don't hunt in, in herds or packs or move around in those kind of communities anymore, but the wiring hasn't. The threat responses haven't. Now they're triggered by social threat, as I, sp I explained earlier, but it creates the same physiological and thinking response. When we say non-conformance, that's one of the biggest perpetrators of why safety gets it wrong or has got it wrong up until now because we've looked at what culture is. Conform. What does conform mean? You're one of us. You belong. Something that is interpreted of life and death is actually interpreted the same way as physical pain and that's why they use social isolation in prisons because it literally is physically painful for that person. So when someone says you don't conform, ah, that's not the way we do things around here. Jeez. And the interesting thing about this feeling of exclusion is it has detrimental productivity effects. One of the things is if you become less engaged, which some of the speakers will talk about today, but you also uh, engage in procrastinatory behavior, you have less ability to, have, uh, to engage in or put off self-defeating behavior, and you're less pro-social which means you volunteer less and you show less initiative. If I feel excluded from a group, I'm not gonna pick up a piece of paper that I see at their desk, because I don't feel part of that group. Then by association, because I'm excluded, they're showing, oh, he's not showing initiative. I'm not gonna reach out to him. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And remember, we're so hypersensitive to exclusion because it meant life or death for us. So we, we often say at the Neuroleadership Institute that if you're not consciously including you're probably unconsciously excluding. Because what you do is automatically triggered by a threat response in the brain. Because that's the way your brain is wired. The last point talks to fairness. 
and a perception of fair exchange that talks to am I being equitably, equitably treated uh, with regards to others. What I want to show you uh, to, to, to end off is a, a small video and an experiment to show what happens when there's a, not a perceived sense of fair exchange. And I want you to watch this experiment and tell me if the best thinking or the worst thinking was used. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, that's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. So I think it's pretty clear to see there uh, who was using their best or their worst thinking their rational, best thinking, or their emotional and habitual behaviors. So the last slide that I'll leave you with is making this a bit more practical. According to SCARF, according to status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness, how do we make sense of that for our people? How do we, when we're changing behavior and talking about behavior change or culture, are we valuing and respecting our people? Are they in the loop? Do they fully understand why they're doing something for how long and what it makes sense of in the big picture? Do they have a sense of control? And this may not seem easy in a very black and white and compliance driven environment, but it can be done. How do, they, how do we speak to their sense of belonging? How do we create social learning groups that function outside of QA that become not QA fighting the rest of the business or, or safety fighting the rest of the business, but a way of doing things here because that's how we define who we are as a culture? And how do we ensure that everyone is treated fairly? That's all from my side today. <laughs>